Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Man, uh, by the way, for you guys that are uh, new around here and this is the first time you've heard it rain in a metal building, that's all that, that's what you're hearing up there. So uh, it's all good and uh, we need the rain. Amen. So, uh, hey, Brian, thank you. Y'all give these guys a hand. Amen. I tell you every week, this is a learning process and uh, it doesn't, it's not as easy as it looks uh, to get up here, yeah, uh, to get up here and do that. And so uh, I appreciate these guys. Sometimes it gets a little wonky and sometimes it gets a little goofy and uh, so, hey, it's kind of like my preaching, amen? Uh, you just <laughs> never know uh, what it's going to end up. So uh, I, I'm really grateful for these guys and just what God's doing. It's just going to continue to get better and better and better, amen? So uh, let, I, I'm really excited this morning, we're going to conclude our series of the, we've been working through all the summer, what would Jesus do? And I want to make an honest confession. A couple of months ago, we in our small group were going through a study by Andy Stanley called Right in the Eye. It's a study on the book of Judges. And every week we would finish that study and go, our church needs to hear that, or our teenagers need to hear that. And, and one week would go by, and then the next week we'd say it again. Gosh, our church needs to hear that. Man, our, our small group, our, our kids, need to, David needs to play this in youth, and Ashley needs to play this in children. Children, not really, but uh, you know, just all through we were going through that. And so what I want to do is I kind of want to pull from that material this morning as we land this. And I, I want to have integrity before you because some of you may go watch this in your small group and go, gosh, Andy Stanley's listening to Edward. He's not. <laughs> I'm listening to Andy. So uh, uh, we're going to learn from him this morning. But I wanted to have integrity with that and let you know that. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about some hard subjects. And, and we've been talking about, uh, namely, last week, probably one of the most difficult subjects. If I just kind of go back there, if you missed that, we talked about last week that in order for us to live in victory and, and live where God wants us to live, we're going to have to crucify the flesh. To crucify the flesh. And I told you last week, and Danielle and I were talking about this yesterday, even as uh, we, we were at the house, that, that sometimes crucifying the flesh is going to be painful. It's going to be painful both spiritually, psychologically, and very honestly, it's going to be painful for some of us physically. Because that's part of us becoming more and more like Christ, to use our bodies, our, use our appendages, our thoughts, our actions, our mind, our will, and emotions as instruments of righteousness and not instruments of the flesh. And the problem is many of us, we love the fact that God has forgiven us, but what we don't realize is, is not only has God forgiven us of our sins legally and on paper or, or kind of spiritually on paper, he's also forgiven the sinner, which means our actions should change. And anytime we just say, well, this I'm forgiven and I'm going to do whatever I want to do, we call that cheap grace. And so we understood last week when we looked at justification and sanctification that they're, they're, they're separate terms to be taught, but they go together that we have been justified. But in justification comes our sanctification, which changes our behavior, which changes what we do. Now, the bottom line, this kind of hits at the underbelly of what we call the American dream, doesn't it? And you know what that is, don't you? It's a kind of the unspoken part of the American dream. In fact, I want you to look at this. Look at this on the screen. Because here's what we have in us deep down. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do what I want, when I want, and with whom I want. And here's the fine print. Because see, all you in the room kind of go, yeah. But I can't say that in church, right? 
Because see, here's the fine print. Look at it. I want to do what I want to do with whom I want. Look at this next line. Next screen, guys. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone. And the problem is, if you do this long enough, you're going to hurt somebody, aren't you? You're, for example, you're going to hurt you. And by the way, can I just clarify something for somebody in this room? You are somebody. And if you continue to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, you're eventually going to hurt you. And eventually you're going to hurt other people. And eventually you're going to hurt your parents. Eventually you're going to hurt your job. Eventually you're going to hurt the next generation and the people that come after you if we continue to do what we want to do. And this whole summer, we've been talking about these cultural issues. And, and for some in the room, they've been real uncomfortable. And others are, you're like, yes. And then others are like, I really don't know what kind of church this is. And, and we've been talking about these things. And the whole deal is for many of us in this room, we never think about what we're doing is going to affect other people. I mean, we all remember when we were children, right? And teenagers, I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it with whom I want, right? You remember that? Or how about that freshman year in college when you hurt yourself because you failed out and you got to the next year of college because you were hurting yourself doing what you want to do? And life goes on, it looks different. Your late 40s and your 50s, you start trying to live again like a teenager, right? And it begins to hurt you. And it begins to come back on you. And then you finally realize in your 40s and 50s, there's too much at risk and you're way overweight and you don't look like a teenager anymore, amen? Okay, we've been there. That was an uncomfortable laugh. <laughs> but you see, eventually, if we continue to do this, somebody's gonna get hurt. And it's going to start with you. And we all have our stories, don't we? And every week that we've gone through, with everything we've looked at, every one of us have a story and it's connected. And so what I want to do is I want to go back to the book of Judges. It's in the Old Testament. I remember, I think it was about a year and a half ago. Excuse me, I think it was a year and a half ago, Joe, you preached on this. And I just, I kept going back to this when we were going to that sermon. Joe's one of our elders. And some of you are looking at me like, who's Joe? And uh, I, he preached on this. I just remember this. And, and even as we were going through this back in May as a small group, I, I just kept thinking about this. And the book of Judges is a, is a piece of ancient history of, of the Israelite community. And the Israelites uh, were God's people. And Moses got them out of Egypt and they went across the, uh, the desert and, and, and they, they, as they came out of Egypt, Moses dies and then Joshua ends up taking them into the promised land. And so the book of Judges is about them moving into the promised land and kind of what happened there. And, and, and there, this was a season where there was no king of Israel. They were ruled by judges. And, and so the children of Israel didn't have a physical king. They had a spiritual king and God. And then they had judges set up for, the, for them to rule over them. So they were, they were leading, being led by an invisible God, but they had these judges that would, that, would, that would rule them over there. And it's fascinating because that's kind of what America is too. We have this imaginary for, for America, this, this invisible God. I didn't mean to say imaginary, but for some people it is imaginary. And we're ruled by judges every four years, sometimes every eight years. And, and the people rebel against that because they want to do what they want to do. So there's a whole lot of interesting things going on here. And they were willing to be a nation of law without a king. Now, Joshua gets them all set up. And Joshua has led them in the promised land and he's got them in there and he's, he's got them all set up and Joshua's about to die. And we, so we go through this period of judges. It's about 300 years and, and the people are supposed to obey the law, right? And they're supposed to serve God and, and they just have these judges that are established. And so here's, here's what would happen. This, this, I want you to show you this on the screen because this is what would go on in Israel. They would have these cycles of sin because they had this invisible God and they had these judges. There would be this time where they would disobey God, there would be disaster, and then God would deliver them. For over 300 years, this goes on in there. Disobedience, disaster, deliverance. Disobedience, disaster, deliverance. And over and over again, we see this in the book of Judges. And so they would get back to God and say, God, we'll never do that again. I promise I'll never do it. We're done. We're done. We're done. And they disobey God again, and God would deliver them. They'd disobey God, and they'd cry out to God, and they'd deliver them. Not much different than who we are today, right? Okay. So this goes on. Now, it's interesting because the book of Judges ends like... Um, 
Halloween 4 meets deliverance. I don't know if you've ever read the Bible or not. Uh, some of you think the Bible's boring. You need to go back and take some time to read the end of this story because we don't have time to go into it because it is just, it's like the worst story you would ever read. I mean, it's, it's gory. It's, it's, I mean, I remember when we were watching this a couple months ago. I was literally sitting there going, I don't remember this in Bible school. I mean, it's like, wow, I had to go in the, into my Bible app and go, oh, wow, they cut her up and sent her, what? that's crazy. And so at the end of the book of Judges, it ends with this final statement. It's, it's very interesting. Look at it in Judges 21, 25, it's on the screen. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And look at this statement. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In those days, there was no moral bonding of conscience. There was no moral bonding of consensus. Everyone just kind of followed their own moral compass. Sounds a whole lot like today, doesn't it? Sounds a whole lot about what we've talked about all summer. They just kind of made it up as they went. And they just said, hey, I want to do what I want to do when I want with whom I want. But back then, they didn't really care if they hurt anybody. They didn't really care. They weren't as civilized as us. And today we all wanna go back to the beginning because I wanna see how it all started. Because I think it has some application for us today as we land this series. Because the book of Judges begins like the nice last night of church camp. You ever been to, how many of you guys grew up at church camp? I, I know some of you didn't go to church, right? Uh, but how many of you guys remember that last night? What always happened on the last night of church camp? You, okay, I, I'm, here's what happened. All the girls get together and they cry. <laughs> Y'all remember that? And they don't even know why they're crying. One starts it and then the next one comes and the next one comes and then they're passing around Kleenex and it goes on and it's just this kind of crazy event. And if you think Christians are weird, this will pretty much solidify it because you're like, yeah, that's why I don't do that. And everybody's down crying and everybody's going and, and here's why they're doing that. And this is so good because I'm telling you, sometimes we, we kind of discount that. But the last night of church camp is important because that's the night that kids and teenagers and children they're going to have it tonight at preteen camp. Our kids are at preteen camp and all the girls are going to be crying and they're not going to know why. And here's why it's important because they're making commitments that are going to change their life. And it's important. I mean, they've been at camp all week. They've heard teaching. They've had small groups. They've had music. It's been incredible. They've been off their phones. Yeah. You can learn from that. They're making changes in their life. And you remember this. So some of you remember coming home and you know that when you were gonna come home, you had to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, right? You remember that? And they're gonna patch things up with their parents. They're actually gonna tell their brother and sister they love each other for a week, right? <laughs> and they're gonna pretty much quit doing everything. Not gonna smoke, not gonna drink, not gonna hang out with the wrong friends, they're not gonna sneak out at night. They're pretty much gonna quit their whole life. That's why they're crying. <laughs> right? Y'all remember that? But it's sincere. I mean, those were important commitments. I don't wanna make light of it. But, but those were right commitments. And it's this big Kleenex fest. It's good, it's good, it's really good. And the book of Judges begins with the last night of camp. I don't know if you knew that or not. What happens is Joshua, he's about to die. He gathers the nation together. He's about to leave them. This is it. They're in the promised land. They're going to be on their own. Joshua's not going to be there in the morning. And he gives this big speech. And he basically, uh, he just, he gives this huge speech to him going, you're going in. Guys, you're all alone. And, that. and the, actually the book of Judges starts in the last chapter of the book of Joshua in Joshua chapter 24. Look what it says. Because this is Joshua. He's coming to the end. He's about to turn them loose. In Joshua 24, verse 14, 14 he says, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestors' worship. In other words, quit smoking, quit drinking, quit doing all those things, right? Last night of camp. Throw away the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. In other words, this is that last night of camp. Go home, break up with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, patch up your parents, do all that. Joshua's kind of giving them, get rid of your stash, get rid of your drugs, do all this. And, and he gives this long speech. And the people answered him in verse 16. Look what they said. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Remember that night at camp? David, we'll never go back. You, Pastor, we'll never. Miss Ashley, we're never going to go back to that. That's, that's what the people are saying. And then in verse 17, they keep going. 
It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt. We weren't there, but our parents told us from the land of slavery and performed these great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey across among the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. We don't want to go back. Remember saying that? And the Israel's looking at Joshua going, we're not going to ever go back. We don't want to go back to the foreign land. We remember slavery. We weren't there, but our parents told us, but I don't ever want to go back because it's all about slavery. God's our king. And he's given us a law. You don't have to worry about us, Joshua. We're going to be fine. And then Joshua does something that I never did as a youth pastor, Lisa. I never did this. And then when I think about what Joshua did, he kind of gives this big honking speech to the youth group. We're going home, guys. We're going to get on the bus tomorrow. We're going to, we're, you guys are going to take Hawkins America by storm. And Joshua does something to the to the children of Israel. He kind of just goes, no, you're not. That's an encouragement, isn't it? I just never thought about doing that as a youth pastor. Coming to the last night of camp, I was as excited as they are. And then I was like, yeah, let's go get them, man. Let's go hand out tracks at the mall and put tracks in mannequins' hands and accost people and do all that stuff, you're right? And so Joshua looks at him and he just kind of taunts him. Look at verse 19. Joshua said to people, you're not able to do it. You're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. <laughs> Joshua looks at him and goes, I bet you can't do it. Isn't that encouraging? I mean, what if you walk the aisle and one of our elders or one of our prayer team says, you know, you're coming down and you're going, man, pray for me that I'll go home and I'll do the right thing. No, you can't. <laughs> you just can't. I mean, this is the story here. And they were like, no, 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 God. We're going to do it, Joshua. You don't have to worry about us. We're going to make it. Joshua goes, no, you're not. Nope. Look at verse 21. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. And Joshua goes, okay, I warned you. I warned you, bunch of rebels, you can't do it. I mean, can you imagine that church growth model? <laughs> oh, you can't do it. Me ain't gonna reach Hawkins, I warned you. <laughs> and then Joshua died. People were in the land, go oh God. The flowers over Joshua's tomb hadn't even died yet. When lo and behold, look at Judges chapter two, verse 11. <laughs> Then Israel did <laughs> then Israel did <laughs> evil. We'll never go back in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. I mean, they hadn't even changed clothes yet from the funeral. <laughs> and they abandoned. We'll never do it, God. They got home from camp and went right back to the stuff they had done before camp. Isn't that amazing? And the text goes on in verse 12. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the very stories they grew up hearing, who had brought them out of Egypt, and they followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They started looking around in the promised land. Joshua wasn't there anymore. And they were supposed to follow an invisible God and be ruled by judges. And they started looking around and going, you know what? That looks fun. Man, I want some of that. Hey, I, I, I kind of I want to, can I do that? And, and see, they didn't want to be oddballs and they didn't want to be weird and they didn't want to be strange and, and they're much like us. We don't want to be differentiated in the world today that we live in and we don't want to be oddballs and we look around and go, why do they get to enjoy that and we don't? And, and, and hey, I just want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, and how I want to do it because hey, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, it's only affected me, right? But eventually it's going to affect somebody and you are somebody. And that's why it's important to look at this. And you see, they did what was right in their own eyes. They abandoned the invisible king. They abandoned the law of God. They immersed themselves in the culture of the Canaanites right after Joshua said, guys, don't do this. Don't do this. Look at verses 12 and 13 of Judges 2. It says, they forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors who brought them out of Egypt and they followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. 
Now the bell and the asherahs were basically, uh, the, the bell was a, uh, the male part, the asherah was the female part of bell. There were two kind of parts. And this was a big no-no for the Jews, not only because they weren't supposed to have idols and serve gods of idols, but you gotta understand the primary problem with this is everything went along with worshiping a male and female deity is that for one thing, when the, these people, the Canaanites got desperate, they would sacrifice children to appease the gods or get their attention. And if things weren't bad enough, they would then sacrifice more children to them and to the point where they would sacrifice multiple children just to get their God's attention. If that didn't get their God's attention, if things got really, 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 really bad, then the rich people would be in the Canaanites would be asked to, to sacrifice their firstborn children to get the God's attention. So you can kind of look around this and go, what were they thinking? And God says, you can't be a part of this. Now, I know we are much more sophisticated than that, right? Because none of us would look around and go, hey, I want to sacrifice kids. Look at verse 14 and 15. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into their hands of the raiders who plundered them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them. Just as he had sworn to them, they were in great distress. And basically, God said this, you want to be like the Canaanites? How about I let you be conquered by the very people you're copying? How about I just let you be conquered by the very thing you're, cop you're copying? You abandoned me freely. You abandoned me freely. But listen to this. I know what you wanted. I know you wanted freedom. But, but here's what's happened. You just lost what was most important to you. And that is your freedom. Because the very thing you wanted that you knew God said no is the very thing that now masters you. Don't be like your ancestors, he said. You willingly disobeyed and you walked away to embrace the culture. You see, that's why we spent this whole summer talking about culture. How do we respond to it? Because see, we're not that much different than the children of Israel. When we start looking around going, why, why can't I enjoy that? And why can't I do that? And why can't I do that? And, and hey, I want to live and love anybody I want to love and live because it's my right. And you become conquered by the nations around you. And you forsake God. And in the end, and here's the point, in the end, and it kind of slips up on us. We don't really see it's coming until it's too late, do we? You remember that? Remember as a teenager, I want to do what I want to do, when I want to do it, with whom I want to do it. And hey, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody, I'm going to do it because that's what I want to do. Remember that? And then all of a sudden it kind of slips up on you and you go, uh-oh, uh-oh. See, look at this next screen because we all get there. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Now I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And then it slips up on us. Look at this next statement because everyone has been there. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Now I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. And I don't like it. And worse than that, I can't quit. You ever been there? You see, Israel simply traded one king for another. They simply traded one king for another. And anytime you trade one king for another king, eventually you're not going to be able to resist that king. And there's a huge lesson in for, for all of us. And I think you kind of get it. All of us have our own story. We've all kind of been there, hadn't we? And you know the basic right from wrong. You've memorized scriptures, but, and you've said those statements, I'll never go back, I'll never go back, I'm never gonna let her move in, I'm never gonna let him move in, I won't let him move in again, I won't let her do that, I'm not gonna drink that much, I'm not gonna do that. And maybe you made a decision, and maybe it was gradual, maybe you made a firm decision of going, you know what, I'm done. I'm not gonna do this anymore, I wanna do what I wanna do. And others of us, it just kind of gradually came about because you began to copy the culture. And the more you copy the culture, somewhere along the way, you decide, you know what? I want to do what I want to do. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. And it, hey, I'm not hurting anybody else. But by the way, you are somebody. And eventually, you'll hurt you. You see, the reason, without meaning to, and it always slips up on us, 
And this is what we're talking about. Look at this statement. It's the reason is we just traded one king for another. We traded the king for a little king. And this may be offensive, so don't tune me out. Don't write me an email. Just listen to me. You and I were created, which means there's a creator. Your mom and daddy didn't get together and create you. God created you. They're not that good. (laughs) But you and I were created. And this is the offensive part. You and I were created to be ruled over. No amen on that. Okay, let me say that again. You and I were created, ready for this? To be ruled over. (laughs) Thank you. Which means when you say no to one king, you always choose another king. There is no such thing as absolute and total autonomy. I know some of you think you are. Nope, nope, no, no, I'm autonomous. Let me ask you this. Did you control your birth? No. So you're not autonomous. Can you control your death? You may be able to delay it. You may be able to end it yourself. But you know what? You don't know when you're going to die. So you're not autonomous. And yet some of us believe we are. And by the way, if you were completely autonomous, nobody would like you. Amen? And you understand this. Because see, some of us have traded one king for another king. How about our appetite? Can we just talk about that for a minute? Because see, all of us started out, you remember when you were skinny in third grade, amen? <laughs> Anybody else remember that? That's about the last time I remember that, okay? And so and somewhere along the way, you got out of college and that freshman 15 or that freshman 20, and some of us, okay, I won't bring that up, but uh, it kind of goes along and we, we get our 30s and, and then our 40s come around and all of a sudden you're just tired of eating right, and you're tired of doing right, and you wake up one day and you're just exhausted. You go, you know what? I just want to eat what I want to eat and have what I want to have and I'm just going to do it. You remember making that decision? No, you really don't remember it, do you? Because somewhere along the way, you just kind of became like everybody else. And see, the thing about doing what's right in your own eyes, you just become like everybody else. And God did not save us to become like everybody else. And we get this, debt. Okay, I won't go there because that hurts. And see, we just basically trade one king for another. And one of the problem is, is that you want to be a Christian, but where you work and live and where you play, being a Christian is weird. And people look at you differently. Danielle and I talk about this all the time, that the more people get to know us, the less parties we get invited to. Because <laughs> nobody wants the preacher there. Because he's judging us or he's going to look at us weird and Christians are weird. See, we look around and we see that. And maybe that's happened to you, where people have quit talking to you. I always love walking up at parties and people are talking and I'll walk in and it gets totally silent and I'll sit there and look at everybody and just walk off. (laughs) Just to mess with them, you know? They're like, oh, crud, here's a Christian. He's a preacher, crud. I'll just stand there and walk on. Um, And you get that. And so basically what happens is you quit playing the game. And some of you quit playing the game of Christianity a long time ago because it's just weird. And all of a sudden, your insecurity is ruling you. And that's how it starts, these little kings. And that's how they get us involved and they get us to start saying, I won't. In fact, let's just say that together. Say, I won't. Come on, say it with me. I won't. Say it again. I won't. Because that's what we do, isn't it? And those little kings get us to do that. Be your own man. Be your own woman. The American dream, right? Be a man. Be a woman. I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to stand up for this, and I'm not going to do that. And then it begins to come right over into our culture of church. I'm not going to be ruled, and you're not going to tell me what to do, preacher. Now, you'll go to your doctor all day long, and he'll tell you what to do, and she'll tell you what to do, and you'll go, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. You let a preacher get up here and start talking like that. You, how dare you? Oh, come on. You want to finish this, Joe? Because I'm, I'm, I think they're about to throw me out of here. See, it's amazing, isn't it? Little kings tempt you by saying, I won't. I'm not going to obey. I'm not going to be morally pure. I, I'm not going to tell the truth. I'm not going to live on a budget. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm not. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. And then you wake up finding yourself saying, I can't. I can't. I can't get away. 
I can't back out. I can't change. See, listen, listen, Danielle and I were talking about this last week. I think a lot of people that are involved in these subcultures of, uh, of what we've been talking about this summer that have become major items in our culture today, I think so many people are find themselves in that place going, I won't. It's what I've always been. It's what I told I was. I'm going to be. I was born this way. I'm never going to change. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in their 30s and 40s going, I really want out, but I don't know how. Because I've been owned. I'm in slavery, it almost feels like. And you can almost hear the pain in their voices when you talk to them. See, some of you hadn't talked to anybody that's in that culture or this culture or involved in that or look different than that because you're too afraid it's gonna jump off and get on you. It's not the way sin works. <laughs> Have a conversation with somebody and you'll hear the pain of going, I can't stop, I wanna change, I wanna change. I wanna go back, I wanna go back to the days where there was a clear conscience. I wanna go back to the days where I had people around me that loved me and supported me. I wanna go back to those days when I was connected in a healthy community. I just don't know how I can't. Because those little kings, the kings of lust and greed and comparison and insecurity and fear, they don't love you. They don't have their, your best interest in their mind. And it's interesting because we were going through this study in May. He asked the question in that, why is it easier to say no to God than it is to say no to those things that you substitute for God? We'll say no to God in a heartbeat, but we won't say no to debt. We'll say no to God in a heartbeat, but we won't say no to sex if she offers. Oh, I mean, think about it. Why is it easier to say no to God? God, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm leaving. God, I've had it with her. I've had it with him. I'm going to forgive him. God, I, I'm telling you, I'm a senior in high school. Shut your eyes. I'll be back in nine months. I'm a freshman in college. God, just give me about three years. I'll come back around. Just close your eyes, God. I have to say no to you for three years, but God, just, just forgive me. I'm going to, I'll be back. Why is it easier to say no to God when, when you know she's not good for you, when you know he's not good for you, when you know you haven't gotten any business being in that, it's time to move on. No business seeing her on the side or him on the side. And you've already got all that worked out because nobody knows and nobody's going to find out. And even if they find out, you've already got that worked out in your mind. And yet we'll say no to God and say yes to these little kings. And then all of a sudden it's an addiction and it begins to control you, and it wrecks you financially. You see, I want to show you what little kings will do to you. Look at this on the screen, because substitute kings are not merciful. Substitute kings do not love you. Substitute kings will control you, and substitute kings will take away your freedom. And here's where I believe freedom comes from. Look at this statement. Next screen, guys. Maximum freedom is only found under the canopy of God's authority every time. Now look, look, look at me, church. Look at me. You and I were created. Therefore, there's a creator. And his intention for us was to be free under his authority. But because you and I wanted to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it, however we wanted to do it, brokenness came into our life. The Bible calls that sin. All sin leads to death. And what happens for you and I is the only way for you and I to be made right with God is to come under the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords through repenting and believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our maximum freedom is only found under the canopy of God's authority. You go, no, 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 Edward, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because, Edward, you don't understand how complicated it is. Yeah, because brokenness leads to brokenness. Amen? Amen? That's why I told you last week, you've got to crucify the flesh. Right. And crucifying the flesh is going to be painful. It's going to be painful because, see, some of the brokenness you're involved in, it may take you years to unwind. Come on. And see, this is where my, my pastor heart comes in because I, I just I find this so crazy. For many of us in this room, you feel stuck. You feel stuck, and you're sitting there going, God, I, this is what I want. 
but I don't know how to get there. And you remember Israel, they would disobey God. They would cry out to God and God would deliver them. And what I find so interesting about is even when the Lord's anger burned against them, it's okay, all right, you want to do that? And go on, I, I, I'm going to burn you down. And for eight years, if you go and finish this story, for eight years, they were controlled by the Canaanites. Eight years. Think about that. And yet when they cried out to him, when they had enough, and I think that's where some of you are, you just had enough. You, you don't know how to get out of that relationship because now there's children involved and there's debt involved. I'm telling you, it's complicated. It's com I, I get it. That, that's why that whole thing of sexuality and, and homosexuality and gender, it's, it's just not black and white. It's a sin. Yeah, it's sin. But see, it's complicated when you begin to come out of that. <laughs> Things get nuts. And that's where the church goes, well, you know, y'all, no. Uh -uh, that's what God called us to. Because when the Israelites cried out, he was merciful. He was merciful. And that's what I love about God. He's not going to force his way on us. He's going to let you choose. And you know why you get to choose? You know why it's so easy to say no to God? Because maximum freedom is found under the canopy of God's authority. And he does not want to control you. If God wanted to control us, he would have made us controlled. Amen? He gave us freedom. God wants to love you, and he wants you to love him back. And just as he took Israel back over and over and over again, he'll take you back. You see, nothing gives me greater joy, and I've heard pastors say this, and to see when the light comes on, when I'm sitting in an office or I'm sitting across the table drinking coffee and we're, we're talking about those things, pastor. I know you've had those experiences through the years, and you see all of a sudden the light comes on. But here's what breaks my heart. You'll never get your 20s back. Come on. You're not going to get your 30s back. You can't reparent your children. You can't show up to things you should have shown up at. You can't have that first marriage back. Those years, those experiences, once they're gone, they're gone. And they were wasted serving little kings. And I don't know what your little king is. And I don't know what's dominating you right now. See, the bottom line is in our attempt to do what we want to do, when we want, and with whom we want, understand and don't be deceived. All you do is trade one king for another. And by the way, we were meant to be ruled. That's why they wrote King of Kings. <laughs> to mock him. Not knowing all along, he's the king. That we were meant to be under his rule. But we decided to do what we wanted to do when we wanted to do it, how we wanted to do it. And eventually, it led to brokenness. And in brokenness, the only way we can be restored is to do what Israel did for 300 years. <laughs> I, mean, I, I find that almost funny if it wasn't so sad. And, and don't mistake what I'm saying here, because some of you will be going, well, heck, he, he was merciful for 300 years for them. I'm just going to keep on doing what I want to do when I want to do it and how I want to do it. Listen, you don't get another shot at this. You don't get a shot to reparent. You don't get a shot to do the 20s over again, to do college again, to do high school again. So, while you exchange one king for another, I would ask you to consider the king of kings. That while we were still sinners, God postured himself in front of us to say, I love you. I love you. And God took our sins and placed our sins upon him. And at the same time that our sins were placed on him and he died on the cross, that when we repent and believe, his righteousness is now accredited to us so that you and I are made right before him. And as we crucify the flesh in restoration, redemption, newness of life, I realize for some of your situations, it's complicated. We used to laugh about that relationship status on Facebook. It's complicated. It is. 
And you're going to need to be in a journey with people. We're fixing to launch small groups in a few weeks. And that's why I love small groups is because it allows us to work out our salvation in the midst of people who love you and support you. I would not be here if four years ago I was not involved in the group I'm still involved in. They loved me. They walked with me. And it was complicated. And they loved me. They didn't try to fix me. They just loved me. And when I didn't want to come to group, they didn't scold me. They loved me. I shouldn't have looked at you. Have you met him? Have you ever had a time in your life where you were truly changed by the King of Kings and Lord Lord? See, here's what motivates me when I look at that 300 years of disobedience, crying out, and deliverance, is that God is merciful. Why would I want to run from him? And I know, I can hear Joshua, you can't do it. I can't. That's why I've got to be under his authority. And so do you. Let's pray together. Lord, I love you. And I thank you over and over again, Father, for how you've loved me. And continue. And Father, I know that there's some folks here this morning that very honestly, they're in a bind. Their situation is complicated. They're involved in a relationship they don't know how they're going to get out of. Maybe somebody's listening online. And they're involved in a relationship and kids are involved. And they don't know how it's going to unwind. God, would you give them courage? Would you give us courage in this room just to cry out to you? If there's someone here this morning, God, that they have never given their life to you through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by believing on him, then God, would you give them courage in just a few moments as our elders and our prayer team are across the front of the stage that, God, you would give them courage to come and grab one of them by the hand and say, I need to be saved. I'm broken. I'm broken. I need Jesus. Father, for those in this room that they don't know how they're going to get out, Give them courage, Father, to reach out and to cry out, to get into a group of people to work that out. Father, thank you for a church that we can work out some emotional stuff, not be afraid of it. You weren't afraid of it. Dad gum, Lord, you reached out to Israel when they were killing babies. Surely. There's room for the sinner in this room that thinks you're done with them. You delivered Israel every time. God, you'll deliver the one who's doubting you. So, Father, grab their heart today. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this time that we can respond. And thank you, Father, for continuing to mold us and shape us into your image. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me? We're going to respond this morning, and if you're new to Summit, the way we respond is we have some guys across the front, elders and prayer team, that would love to pray for you. And if you don't know Jesus, we'd, we'd invite you to come be a part of that. If you know Jesus in this room, and you have a relationship with him, whether you're a member of Summit Heights or not, we invite you to take communion. We have four tables, two at the front and two in the back, and we'd love for you to take communion with your family, pray together. If you need prayer or salvation, that's why these folks are across the front. We'd love to minister to you. So let's respond this morning, and let's worship. Amen? Amen. You come. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.